So I think I should start with a personal story because this is autoethnography, right? So my first exposure to communal living was in college. Uh, and upon arrival, I quickly got involved with a collective house called Crafts House, and living there had a huge impact on me. I still go back there from time to time when I'm doing recruiting work for the FEC. After I'd lived there for a few years, I began to put words to this sensation that I was having when I entered into the house. And the sensation was like I was entering into a larger creature and becoming it in some way. I didn't really know what that meant, but I was feeling it. So I started dumpster diving and thinking about death and rebirth, and I was studying philosophy of biology and Newton's alchemy. I have a privileged education, right? I got really into Jungian psychology, entered into Jungian psychotherapy. I was wondering a lot about, like, magic and what souls were, if they were anything. And I learned about things like endosymbiosis and the word superorganism. And then when I graduated, I tried to start a collective house that was similar to Crafts House. I made this video about an idea that I called the Gleaner's Kitchen. Hi, I'm Maximus, and this is the Gleaner's Kitchen. And I said I was starting a dumpster restaurant. <laughs> There's one thing we haven't yet figured out how to dumpster, and that's a restaurant space. <laughs> um, the video went viral, and I was totally unprepared. I raised some money and I put it all into a summer's rent of an apartment and a basement and we began moving in and then we got evicted like within a week. <laughs> it was really fucked up. Hi everyone, so this is a very sad update. Uh, we just got evicted from our location for the summer. Um, we're in scrambling mode, we don't really know what we're doing. The landlord googled me, I mean there are many reasons why we got evicted, but one of them, like the biggest one, was that the landlord was tipped off and googled me and found out that I was planning on starting a dumpster restaurant in his basement, and I hadn't told him that before I signed the sublease, because... <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so I was pretty devastated by the whole affair. My overconfidence had gotten me and my friends evicted, and I had no idea what to do next. There was an upside to this whole thing of getting a viral video and all this news. It got me a publishing deal to write a dumpster cookbook. I spent the summer working on that in this, like, cramped, hastily rented apartment. <laughs> I was, like, really anxious and self-pitiful the whole time. Like, felt like such a failure writing this book about a project that didn't exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and then when September came, I decided that I wanted to live in community somewhere else. I scheduled a visitor period at Twin Oaks. And when I got there, I had an anxiety attack because, well, a lot of things like shock at a new culture, but also I had this cookbook to write with a deadline and I had no time to do that in community. Twin Oaks has lots of labor quotas. So I left and I finished the cookbook at my mother's house and felt like more of a failure. Cookbook's right here, A Curious Harvest. When I was writing the script for this, I went back and read some of the introduction and it made me cringe. Uh, I want to show you some parts. So here's the introduction, and I have this section on, like, capitalism and food values. These are ancient questions that until very recently every human asked before eating. And then I talk about dumpster diving and how it let me relate to food and community. I talk about the crafts house, and there's that, like, weird feeling that I had. I put words to it in this, like, really hokey way. In some sense, it was more accurate to say that the meal was given to us by the house itself. The house fed us, and we were its body, or perhaps its soul. This soul was an amalgamation of the identities of the residents, but there was also something distinct, an independent spirit of the house. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of silly, and then I talk about, like, how value is a social construct, and uh, then I go back to, like, oh yeah, this is a cookbook, by the way, and this is how you cook food and then it's just like beautiful illustrations of different things that you might find in the dumpster like oats or noodles i don't know i wrote this when i was 21 i guess i don't know exactly how this holds up over time but i included it here because i think it sort of contains like primitive adolescent seeds of the ideas that I've still been thinking about and like sometimes in embarrassing ways like I'm embarrassed by how in the intro like I'm constantly using the word we when I'm talking about how I personally felt about Crafts House or the Gleaner's Kitchen. I spoke for the collective in ways that I really had no authority to but it's because I like really very badly wanted to feel fused to that community and there are like a bunch of other clumsy things in the text but I sort of see it as the beginning of autoethnographic documentation. It sort of shows the questions that are still motivating me and that motivated my decisions for, for whatever like personal or privileged 
reasons, I was like, I should go to grad school. I like thinking about things. And so I read a bunch of books and then I contacted Terry Deacon, wanting to think about identity from this autopoetic perspective. Like I was reading Evan Thompson's work and thinking about autopoesis. And then Terry was like, no, autogenesis. And I learned from him. And then eventually I got accepted at Binghamton, chose to go there because David told me that I would be able to study intentional communities from an evolutionary perspective, which I guess is what I'm doing crazily, as it still kind of feels a little bit fake. <laughs> I guess one of the reasons why is as my relationship with the FEC has matured, like a, a strictly scientific perspective of studying selfhood and intentional communities hasn't, it, it's, it's chafed a bit. So it seemed like I needed to shift asking these questions from a more autoethnographic perspective. I'm really concerned with selfhood and agency, and I want to know how the kinds of things which some people call souls emerge from a world in which they're formerly not there. And I want to know how those sorts of things, soul-like things, patterns, I don't know, exist over time, even as the systems in which they're instantiated in change pretty radically. I've got like really unnecessarily speculative ideas about patterns which relate genomes to policy documents, how there's a pattern which relates both of those things to sacred texts. And in my daily life, like my community life, I have chores. <laughs> I'm practically concerned with how to build a functional institution. Like how do we make decisions? How do we relate to members and non-members? How do we make money? We're really poor. How do we hold each other accountable? How do we heal after a conflict? How do we create a system which can outlive its members? I need real like actual functional answers to those questions if I'm going to make a living. But behind it all, I have this like strange belief that there's some theoretical answers to questions about emergence and selfhood that will imply some functional suggestions about the practical community building problems that I work on every day. So my current goal is to be able to describe how communities think. I want to be able to thickly describe semiotic patterns as they develop in a community, and those patterns take many hours or years of thinking with the communities to be able to describe them properly. And an autoethnographic perspective is really important to observe them, because how can I better understand how a semiotic process is unfolding than by thinking it myself. <laughs> After going through several difficult experiences while living in the FEC, I started to think that one effective way to trace the patterns of communal thinking that I think I'm seeing is to explore conflict. Interpersonal conflict is a really serious handicap for the communities movement. Communities fail frequently for complicated reasons, but one major factor is almost always interpersonal conflicts, which escalate and then they permanently damage the whole thing. So I've started to think about conflict from a semiotic perspective. If communities think, then conflict is thought disturbed. Or maybe another way to say it is that conflict represents an information disruption in the system, a pattern or several, which needs to be shared by all parts of the network is blocked from being expressed in some nodes. And the thinking task at hand is to make sure that the thought patterns are replicated in all the nodes necessary for the community to remain healthy. How do those thoughts need to change as they adapt to fit certain minds? And how do our minds need to adapt to fit the thoughts? So an important theme here, I hope I'm making clear, is interpenetration of the type that goes by like fancier than necessary names like autogenesis, symbopoesis is Donna Haraway's term, endosymbiosis is the one that Margulis uses, pratitya samudpada is the, the, the ancient Buddhists, names which recognize that in physical biological systems self and other are blurred and put in tension with each other in strategic ways that emerge a whole. So this is of course the way that I personally choose to describe it and the way that I was thinking about it sort of when I started dumpster diving when I was 19 and thinking about death and rebirth. I'm sure that kind of no one that I live with in community thinks about it just this way. Like, it might be a really <laughs> silly way to think, but there are echoes in other places. Like, nearly all the FEC businesses are in food systems, and for really good reason. Like, Acord runs an organic heirloom seed saving business. They've got a building with like a hundred thousand different seeds, not a hundred thousand, like ten thousand different seed genomes. <laughs> I think about it a lot. I made a video about it. I'll put a link to that video in the description. And at Eastbrook, we often talk about our goals of living symbi-poetically with nature. We don't actually ever say that. That's just jargon for this video. But like, we do think about it through a framework of holistic management. That's the decision-making protocol that Sarah is trained in. And it has a lot of these 
ideas baked into it in a very practical way. And I guess more simply, I think that a lot of people choose to live in community in order to live a life which is less separate from non-human ecologies. Hopefully that's simple. So I think the prompt that you gave me was to think about what I'm doing in terms of intentional communities and autoethnography and social ecology and to explore where the three intersect and to explain why my method is required to meaningfully understand the overlap. I think the answer to the prompt might sound like this. If my goal is to understand something better about the emergence of selfhood, then a productive way to explore that could be to examine selfhood as it emerges and develops across multiple communal scales. I, and other people at Eastbrook, view the creation of the community as a kind of birthing process. Sarah has used this metaphor several times in our conversations. And in this metaphor, for me, as a kind of higher order agency emerges, the selves which make it up are transformed. And those transformations are particularly apparent in times of conflict, when the community is compelled to think extra carefully, and when collective thought becomes difficult. The result of this process, if it goes well, is a new kind of symbiotic hybrid agency, which consists of all of the different species of self which have evolved to live together, as well as new ones created in the exchange. And that sounds really dumb, and I need to massage this much better so that it sounds less like woo-woo hippie bullshit. But I do think this very seriously, uh, so that's the task, um, is to figure out how to say that right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe, maybe I should go back to the writing cookbooks.